introduce our dean again, since he's here, Mr. Dale Van Dam. With us, Paul Lee from the League of Women Voters is here to hold down the lead tonight. Thank you very much. And tonight, uh, the questions will be directed to both candidates. I can't just direct questions to just one candidate. We'll begin with opening remarks. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> My name is Craig Turkelson. I'm a captain with the Sheriff's Department, longtime resident of El Dorado County, longtime employee of the Sheriff's Department. I say that because I've got experience in almost every uh, part of the Sheriff's Department. Also, I started my career um, as a lot of us did back then up in South Lake Tahoe, and the county was cutting back in 83 or so. So I actually got to spend a year with the South Lake Tahoe Police Department, so I got a little experience there. Um, you know, in, in our department, you, it's deputy, sergeant, lieutenant, and captain. I'm a captain. I've supervised approximately one-third of the department right now, um, assigned to the jail system in Placido and Tahoe. Um, I, I think the, the top things are my uh, priority. You can tell by how many people are here, really, from John's side, and I think my side, and a bunch of other sides, I hope. I think the top thing is to, and this is probably for John, too, is to reunite the, the department get the department back on one page. And you do that uh, by in several different ways, but you do that by in your promotions and your special opportunities within the Sheriff's Department to be frankly blind to who supported you and who didn't support you. And, uh, and my, my pledge is, and I'm sure John echoes the same thing, but my pledge is to do that as, uh, as, as much as humanly possible. The other thing is to target at-risk behavior in our youth. Um, I think alcohol is still the biggest killer of our youth. Uh, the prescription meds that we have in our in our medicine closet, and of course drugs and, and uh, gangs. Uh, just like to end by saying that um, I have the respect and support of people, law enforcement leaders within our community, uh, District Attorney Vern Pearson, uh, the retired Sheriff Jeff Needs, John McGinnis, the Sheriff of Sacramento County, uh, others like uh, Auditor Controller Joe Harn, Supervisor Ron Briggs, Supervisor John Knight, Retired Supervisor Rusty Dupre. So thank you for attending. This is probably the biggest forum that we've attended. So thank you very much. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this is this is one of the biggest things we've had, and it has been, I believe, the 25th forum that Mr. Chris has been involved with to get the message out. Uh, my name is John D'Augustine. I am the other candidate for Sheriff of Colorado County. I'm a fourth generation resident of this county. My great grandparents came and settled here about 1926. Um, prior to my law enforcement career, I was a general contractor built homes primarily in Colorado County, and my law enforcement career is about 17 years, but in Amador County, across the line. My roots are here, and my career has been over there. Then everything from patrol to Chief Deputy Coroner, the Property Crimes Investigator, Narcotics, Narcotic Team Supervisor, Patrol Sergeant. Um, in 03, I transferred to the District Attorney's Office as an investigator. I uh, was assigned a general criminal, did everything from data checks to homicide. And my current position is Second Command of the State Narcotics Task Force. The reason I am running is to break down those barriers that have grown between law enforcement and, and the community over the years. It's real. I see it. I see it both as a community member and as a law enforcement officer. And also, now to break down those barriers that have grown in the sheriff's office. My opponent said he wants to reunite the department. He's in a position now to do that, and this is what's happening. So I'm here to take care of that. I am a leader. I have the leadership ability, the skills, the drive, the youth to take care of this. I'm also proud to be endorsed by uh, Congressman Tom McClintock, um, Assemblyman Ted Gaines, the Northern Alliance for Law Enforcement, which is thousands of law enforcement officers across the state, um, the National Drug Enforcement Officers Association, um, the Taxpayer Protection Committee, People's Advocate, um, Operating Engineers Local for Local 3, and also Local 1. So I have a broad range of support. We've got 10 days left in this race. We're almost there. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks for being here. Okay, that one, and then at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Craig, we'll begin with you. We'll just kind of go back and forth, okay? Uh, do you support Prop 19, and how do you plan to approach implementation if Prop 19 passes? Yeah. 
Thank you. We should end it after the, uh, the, the forum after this. I do not support Prop 19. Um, I think it's a ridiculous law. It has been tried in other states. It's failed. It's increased the use, use of, of marijuana. Um, I'm totally against it. It's, it's adding a, and I, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, when California needs to get more productive, we're, we're, we want to introduce marijuana into society even on a greater basis. And I just think it's a ridiculous combination. Um, as far as implementation, that was a, a real problem with 215. When we had that, it took years to really get uh, the law figured out to where we weren't arresting innocent people and we weren't, uh, we're, weren't ignoring uh, real suspects. So it is going to take some time. Oh, obviously, if it passes as a law enforcement officer, I'll enforce it and, and, uh, and make sure that the law is, is enforced or, uh, or, or the other way around, I guess, you know, if it's, if it's legal. So I'll support it. And I also do not support Proposition 19. It is a bad idea. It has been tried before in other places. It will not work. It's not going to be the tax boom in California that everybody thinks it is or what they're pushing it as. Um, it's, uh, we're going to create another government bureaucracy that's going to cost more to create than any tax revenue this is going to bring in. And I'll give you an example. Right now, at one time, there were more uh, medical, uh, med medical marijuana dispensaries in Los Angeles than there were Starbucks. And when the feds would go in and bust one of these medical dispensaries, they'd go in and they'd say, but we pay our taxes. See, we pay taxes on three and a half million dollars last year. Well, that's great. You've got nine million sitting in the safe. So it's not going to work. The culture is not conducive in California. And also, we're dealing with Prop 215. We're be dealing with the Compassionate Use Act. We have been dealing with that for 14 years now. And that, we finally got that settled in. After, if this does pass, there's going to be so many injunctions and so many, so many stuff tied up in court that as far as how, which way we're going to have to enforce or whatever, that's actually going to be a long time now. So we have to make a decision. You can keep standing. We'll start with you, John, on this one. Please list your top three priorities if you are a Lincoln Chair. My top three priorities are, again, as I said, is breaking down the barriers between law enforcement and the community. Bringing back resident deputy positions in those areas where it's effective and feasible, where I have somebody living there that's willing to do it, is the right person for the position. If not, bring back at least assigned beats where the same deputy works the same place all the time and gets to know the community, and the community gets to know them. Kind of build up, bring back and build up the morale in the department that I think that is, is lacking from me, that we need to work on. We need to get back to the family environment. I want to work hard for my deputy, and my deputy is going to work for me and also be that leader to them. When the sheriff, when the sheriff goes to a, a, an event, don't show up with the inner sheriff or captain, show up with the deputy that's working with the team that empowers everybody. And then obviously the biggest thing right now is getting our budget, dealing with our budget, and keeping many folks on the street, first line deputies, first line supervisors, and the support staff necessary to that work. Obviously the top one has got to be the budget. It's, uh, we're in uh, historic times, you know, back to the Great Depression. Uh, we have not seen anything like this. So it is keeping deputies on the street. It's uh, putting uh, deputies that are in positions now that don't need to be there out on the street, civilianized if we have to, privatized. There's three places that we always need deputies. You need them in narcotics, you need them in detectives, and you need them working in the street. The other ones can be, you know, don't always have to be in, uh, in position. I explain it this way. It may be the best idea to have a deputy doing a background on another deputy. That is the best idea. But the second best idea could be a contract employee that could do it for less than a tenth of the price and um, do that same uh, background, a retired deputy that, uh, that can do backgrounds. Uh, the second priority, actually the first priority probably besides the budget is, uh, I've told you before, at-risk behavior in our youth. It is, it is a huge um, thing for us. I think without spending government money, what you do is you get, have some minute already? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Just keep standing okay. and you can continue on this topic <laughs> of you. Okay, but we're switching the topic to youth, and there's several questions. I'm just going to try to blend them together. Uh, do charter schools increase delinquency? What's the sheriff's role uh, with youth? And uh, uh, what about gangs? 
Okay. I don't know about charter schools increasing uh, delinquency, so let me, what was the second and, and beginning? And, and uh, what about you? Just, yeah, you can general. Well, I, I'm a big, uh, well, okay, I can go right in for my <laughs> last answer. Yeah. I, without spending government money for it, I do think that, that you got to look at the good thing with gangs. I know it sounds silly, but gangs provide a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, some territory. And if you think about what gangs provide for our youth, then we have to substitute something that takes that place. And it's not going to be government programs. There's a lot of uh, programs uh, <coughs> through the church and youth sports uh, to get kids involved. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, uh, just so you know, I, I coach youth sports year-round for, hey, Rachel, I coach Rachel Surratt, um, but I, I coach youth uh, sports year-round for 13, 14 years. I think keeping kids involved is something that gives them a purpose, uh, gives them an identity and some self-esteem is very good, and I'm also actively involved in, in Vision Coalition, which is, uh, which is a um, grant-funded operation down in El Dorado Hills that supplies, or that um, uh, puts out youth projects and keeps them on the coast. I can't comment a little bit on the charter schools because I'm also on the Pioneer Union School District Board of Trustees. I'm in my second term there, eight year, eight thousand budget. Um, I believe in charter schools. I think they're a good thing for the right people. Not everybody, but for the right people. Um, and they can, absolutely. If the person's in the right environment and it's an environment that they can survive in and they do a good job at, then absolutely it's going to keep them out of delinquency. Um, the sheriff's office with the youth, again, getting the deputy back involved with the community and the community back involved with the sheriff's office. I say that when the deputies can drive down the street and, the street and they can wave at a group of kids, and all the kids wave back with all five fingers, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then obviously the gang. We do absolutely have to keep uh, an eye on the gang. They are here for our youth. Um, that's where they're, that's how they increase their numbers. They want our kids. So we do absolutely have to get them identified, get them validated, and then when they do, do mess up, make sure that they're prosecuted appropriately on the, with the proper enhancement. Okay, let's start with you, yeah. Um, how will you be able to provide warm twill coverage to less populated areas of the county? And I think this question is related. What are your plans for residential deputies? Okay. I've never, I've never ever said that I'm going to provide more patrol anywhere. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be trying to protect everything I can right now in this budget. What I am talking about is a different style of enforcement. Where the deputies, when they're not handling a call for service, when they're not down on paper, they're out meeting with people. It's the way I was raised in law enforcement. It's the way that it works. It's effective and it's efficient. What was that second half of that? Uh, so, um, plans for residential deputies. For residential. Again, that's for the right person for the job. If you have an area, wherever it is in this county, and a deputy lives there and they're the right person, they're very community oriented. They, they, they truly understand what it means to do that, to be involved with the community, and they want to take that position, then they own it. They're allowed to flex their schedule, they go to community meetings, they go to um, whatever's going on, baseball games, Little League, what, whatever they can attend, they do. It takes the right person in those areas where it's effective and efficient. Where those areas where it's not, well, we don't have a deputy that can, that lives in the area, then we have a sign to so that we've got the, the he or her, she or he deputy gets to know that community. <coughs> Oh, I'll start with the first one last. Residential deputies are a real good sound bite. They don't work. There's been tons of studies. I've lived through it. They do not work. Um, they're inefficient. Uh, everybody here would like to live next to a deputy sheriff. In the South County, our beats are 450 square miles. There's no way that everybody's going to live next to a, a, a beat deputy. Sounds good. Sounds like a good uh, principle. It doesn't work. Um, we talked about being disconnected a minute ago. Let me tell you how connected our deputies are. We have deputies right here that are scout leaders, coaches, volunteers in their church. These guys, uh, are, are the men and women of the sheriff's department, are connected with this community. Um, so, you know, from sitting here and listening to other candidates, especially candidates that work and are completely disconnected themselves out of county, try to guess about what the sheriff's department is like has been real hard over the past year because I was running against six candidates at one time that were telling to tell me that all the departments disconnected. Well, they they had no connection to the sheriff's department. Connect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Uh, this is an issue we'll give you both a chance to comment on. We 